So our next speaker um, is Giulio Vampa. Uh, Giulio Vampa is a new um, scientist at National Research Council. He came about the first of September, so it's about a year and a, about a month and a half he's been there. Um, Giulio Vampa did his PhD at the University of Ottawa. Um, he worked on high harmonic generation in solids. Um, I look at it that the, we, the way we understand how light, strong light, interacts with solids and how we can see a continuity between what happens in the solid and what happens in the gas, I think that's really Julio's contribution. That's really what he's done. Make us really understand the uh, broad physics that underlines this. After his PhD in 2016, he went to Stanford University where he'd worked with David Rees. David Rees uh, did the first experiments on high harmonics and solids. Uh, so he went from here to Stanford, which was then the home of David Rees and the home of this whole area, high harmonics and solids. He's the technical uh, chair of the chair of the technical group in the OSA and short wavelength sources. And uh, well, as I said, he's just come back to National Research Council and uh, I'll have him, he'll give a talk on what he has learned in Stanford, I guess, and the advances he's made. And I don't, I haven't seen the doc. So I guess we'll all see what he's going to speak about. Julio, please. Thank you, Paul. Here we go. I assume you can see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. Yeah, thanks, Paul and, and Bob, for inviting me to the symposium. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be speaking after uh, Gerard. Uh, so we'll, I'll bring you back down to a much lower, much, much lower energy scales uh, with um, high harmonic generation at the nanoscale. <clears throat> there we go. So what is high harmonic generation? So high harmonic generation is an extremely nonlinear optical process that converts um, intense femtosecond laser fields or photons, possibly at infrared frequencies, to, their, to the high order harmonics. Uh, that is clear in short wavelength radiation. And usually the interaction happens in a gas target or it has been so for a very long time and still is uh, predominantly so. Uh, shown here to the right is the one, a state of the art spectrum that can be obtained during this interaction um, in a noble gas. Uh, with uh, starting from uh, less than one EV photons and generating coherent radiation all the way uh, into the soft texture region up to about 550 electron volts. So the spectral coverage I find is uh, truly remarkable. In 2011, it was as Paul said, it was David Rees uh, in Stanford who discovered that high harmonics in fact can also be triggered uh, from crystals. And shown here is the very first spectrum that was measured. It was from a zinc oxide solid, a crystal, a white band gap semiconductors with a 3B band, band gap. It was pumped by three micron light and it generated radiation all the way up to the vacuum ultraviolet at about 10 electron volts. Now, since then we have, uh, we have done high harmonic from many, many solids. And now we know that almost anything can generate high harmonics provided you choose the laser parameters wisely enough. And, and this is a summary of some of the crystals that we routinely use or that we have used and myself and other people around the world. Um, you can see dielectrics tend to uh, generate the highest photon energies up to about only 50 electron volts. That's kind of the limit in solids at the moment. Uh, when, and they're tendentially pumped with uh, near infrared lasers. Um, and the lower end, instead, you find semiconductors, which can still emit a remarkable uh, 10 V photons or 90 V photons if you're talking about silicon, for example, and they're normally pumped with mid-infrared lasers. Silicon will be the focus of this talk, as most of the nanoscale structuring has been performed on silicon for obvious reasons. We know everything we need to know to pattern silicon. And so, as I said, the spectrum from silicon, it still extends up to non-electron volts, which is an ast astonishing, I would say, for silicon, 120 nanometer wavelength. So it's pretty short. Now, besides the intriguing physical mechanism responsible for this extremely linear interaction, uh, which is in fact much, much richer than what happens in gas phase, harmonic generation, 
and what this interaction can tell us about the solid, uh, which also is quite spectacular. I think solids add an exciting new dimensions to our second uh, science, uh, that is the realization of functional devices. Now, function is largely determined by shape, as you see here for two natural examples, uh, gecko's foot and proteins. Um, but also man-made devices uh, rely on inhomogeneities and, and shape to perform function. Of course, transistor is the prime example of it. And optical devices are no exception to that rule either. Um, for example, um, meta surfaces with their nanoscale uh, features enable precise control of the light properties. And, and so do photonic circuits with their micron scale and nanoscale features allow telecom and computation all with light. Uh, so myself and a few other groups around the world uh, start to design functional attosecond devices or extreme photonic devices, um, effectively laying the groundwork for uh, developing the future attosecond technology, what I think will be the future attosecond technology. <clears throat> Here is a summary. It's quite ex quite ex uh, exhaustive summary of the um, the research that has been done um, on nanostructure surfaces for attosecond applications which also tells you that the field is relatively new and there is uh, much, much to be, to be done. Um, the structures that have been used so far or designed so far essentially rely on either uh, plasmonic uh, features like these uh, sapphire cones coated with metal um, or these antennas on silicon uh, to boost the infrared field strength. Or they also employ all the electric metasurfaces, for example, these cones which were done on zinc oxide or silicon again, as well as this disk and bar type of matter surface. Now recently people have also started looking at uh, peculiar materials that exhibit uh, uh, near zero uh, epsilon uh, permittivity, which also enhance infrared field. And I'll also talk to you about later on another application of these gratings to beat absorption uh, in, in harmonic. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later about why this is I think very important. So in the talk, I'll, I'll present three experiments uh, that I've done um, and I group them in two different uh, streams of research. In the, in the first stream, um, the function of the devices was to boost the nonlinear interaction and they do so by uh, shaping the infrared or the driving field. In the second stream of research instead, uh, the infrared field is uh, quite unaffected by the structure or is not shaped towards the infrared, but instead the function of this device was to beat absorption and they do so by controlling the harmonic wavelength directly. So in the first stream, the first experiment I'm going to show you is about these um, plasmonic antennas on, on a silicon substrate. The research was done uh, in Ottawa and in the NRC uh, in, in 2017. So the antennas were designed uh, as gold antennas onto a silicon substrate, silicon film. The antennas were designed to resonate at about 2.1 micron, which uh, of course is the fundamental driving frequency that we also use in the experiment. And according to the simulation, they exhibit a strong enhancement just beneath the antennas inside the silicon uh, film where harmonic preferentially takes, take, takes place. The experiment, this one and Others are fairly simple at this stage. Uh, essentially, the, we take a 2.1 micron laser pulse, um, manipulate polarization and focus it onto the device, uh, the nano antennas device. The harmonics emitted on the other side are collected and sent to a visible UV spectrometer. So in this case, the detection goes down to about 200 nanometer, but I'll show you later, you can go into the vacuum from silicon. So when we radiate the device with the, um, polarization parallel to the antennas, which is the condition that shows the resonant behavior, we get about a factor of 10 enhancement in the harmonic power over illumination of the bulk or of the structures with the wrong polarization that is perpendicular to the axis. Now, it, it, this factor of 10 actually is quite remarkable, uh, considering that the hotspot created on either side of the antennas, which we estimate based on the simulation and the power scaling that we measure, uh, from the harmonics in the experiment is only about 20 by 20 nanometer square and five nanometer in depth on either side of the antenna. So the emission volume is, is really, really small. And according to this, we estimate that the emission density for high harmonics is 1000 to 10,000 times higher than what you can achieve in an unpatterned surface or bulk. 
metal, of course, don't, uh, according to my experience, don't last very, don't, they don't get along with high intensity fields. And so uh, when we crank up the incident intensity and, and note the scale, we are about uh, uh, 10 to minus one terawatt per square centimeter here. Um, the antennas, uh, you know, show widespread damage or progressive damage with lowers the, the enhancement and eventually emission from bulk uh, takes over. This is an important point I'll, I'll get back to later. Now to overcome uh, the damage of the metal and to sort of increase the emission volume, we, uh, at Stanford we designed um, a resonant metal surface again, but in this case, all dielectric. It also employs the silicon platform, silicon on sapphire. Um, and so it's composed of this array of bars and, and disks uh, and the metasurface exhibits a phenotype resonance or an interference uh, at about 2.3 micron, which of course is also the frequency that we pump it at. Um, the resonance that shows up like this final interference arises from uh, an interference between two pathways. One is the dipolar excitation of the bars due to their shape, they allow the dipolar excitation. And the other one is near field coupling of the power from the bar to the disk and back to the bar, which can radiate afterwards. Um, the disk themselves, because of the shape, they don't allow this dipolar resonance, uh, electric dipole. Whoops. Now, because there is a resonance, uh, the structures still have a high Q, which means they, uh, they allow enhancement of the inferred field. And it's all the electric, which in principle means they have a higher damage threshold and the emission volume is larger because um, um, the light is not confined so tightly as with plasmids. <clears throat> uh, here I show how the the type uh, the metal surface works in in the type domain. Um, in at two, I take two snapshots from the top. Uh, panel D uh, is an early time, and panel E is an later time. And panel F shows instead the complete time evolution at three selected points. Point B is the middle of the uh, bar and points C the middle of the disk and E instead sort of tracks the uh, the dark mode that, that develops inside the disk, which is this ring shaped structure. So the light is coupled directly to point B and then uh, flows straight from point B to point C that is in the middle of the bar of the disk. And eventually uh, when the laser pulse is gone, the power flows by near field coupling to the dark, to the dark mode inside the disk and then eventually slushes back and forth between the disk and the bar. And you can see this here also in the movie, a simulation, of course, of with an incident flat field coming in, uh, couples directly to the bar and then flows to the disc. And then once the laser pulse is gone, the structure resonates, but now power flows from the bar to the disc, eventually develops a sort of a steady state, not a steady state, but uh, develops the, the, the dark, dark mode inside the disc uh, about soon from there, power will then flow back to the bar. And then again, again, until everything is, so this is basically now uh, the mode is developed and then power will flow, starts flowing back to the bar and so on, which is what you saw before. Now, when we radiate the, um, the, um, the structure, the, the device with the polarization parallel to the bars, of course, the, the, the resonant behavior is there and we get about a factor of 30 enhancement compared to illumination of the bulk uh, over the same the same meta surface irradiated with the wrong polarization similarly to what we saw slightly better but similar uh, concept um, of course there is an enhancement in the structure which also means that eventually uh, the um, the meta surface will damage and that's what we see as we increase the excitation intensity uh, this meta surface uh, shows extensive damage and, and uh, emission from the bulk eventually takes over. Now the matter surface uh, shows an obvious resonant behavior um, and, and we show this by uh, shifting the frequency of the of the pump around uh, around between 2.2 and 2.4 micron and uh, whereas the harmonics from the bulk follow the uh, driving frequency harmonics from the matter surface which is panel A, B and C are basically pinned to the resonance of the matter surface and of course the maximum signal is also obtained um, when you pump a resonance. Now, in the last experiment I will present you, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, talk to, I'll talk about the second sort of stream where um, we don't design the matter surface to boost uh, the nonlinearity, 
uh, which is uh, shaping the infrared field. Instead, we designed them to beat an intrinsic limitation of harmonic generation, which is absorption. And uh, what is absorption? The problem with harmonic generation in solids specifically is that the harmonics that we mostly care about are emitted above the bandwidth of the material. And so they're strongly absorbed with absorption length as short as a few nanometers in, these, in, in, in many, many, if not all materials. So to put in perspective the magnitude of the problem, uh, I like to draw this rectangle which uh, shows a, a to scale is a one micron long uh, crystal. Which, and in principle, we have hundreds of microns of crystals in the lab available. Um, and although we you know, propagate our infrared driver throughout the crystal, only radiation emit generated in the last 10 nanometer, which is this purple rectangle at the end, can actually escape the crystal and be detected. So you can imagine how wasteful harmonic generation in solids is by not having all the radiation created inside to escape outside. And so we set out to um, overcome this problem, this limitation, and this is the idea. We design uh, a one-dimensional grading structure. Again, it's on silicon on sapphire platform. Um, and we make the ridges um, much sub-wavelength, the width of them, much sub-wavelength compared to the driving laser wavelength, which means that when infrared light comes uh, from the back to the substrate and couples into the structure, they couples only evanescently, which means that the field is not confined inside the silicon ridges, rather it's quite uniform. And in fact, the highest field strength is found at the silicon uh, vacuum sidewall, on the sidewalls of the ridges. This is where harmonic generation preferentially takes place. And that's also step one in our proposed uh, working principle. In step two, the radiation allows to couple to the gap between two ridges, the slot. And in step three, it propagates in the vacuum channel experiencing minimal losses. Now the method exploits the high density of crystals because we still use silicon as the generating medium. Um, the minimal loss of the vacuum channels, as well as the large surface area available for emission, which is now determined by the length of the gratings. So in the experiment, again, uh, very simple schematically. Um, we use, in this case, a 2.4 micron laser um, delivering three cycle pulses at an 80 megahertz repetition rate. So this is a chromium zinc sulfide laser from IPG Photonics. And um, we focus it onto our device, which, is, which consists of these taper grading structures. And in, which, and in the taper, we, we, we vary the slot width or, or the, the gap between the two slots. The radiation, the harmonics are then uh, collected with a Fresnel zone plate that we design and fabricate in house as well, uh, again with the silicon on sapphire, and send it to a UV spectrometer. And you can see right away that illuminating the narrow gap end or the wide gap end of the, of the structure, we get a strong spectral reshaping. And so translating, in fact, the sample uh, finally across the beam, we essentially study how harmonic generation changes as a function of the slot width. And I show it here for harmonic 9 to 13. The last one is at about 185 nanometers, which is in vacuum. So these, uh, these experiments are carried out in vacuum. And we see a strong modulation of the harmonics with each harmonic showing an independent modulation from the others. This order dependent modulation tells us right away that um, there is the high harmonics are guided inside the slot. And it's not the infrared field strength that cha uh, or changes in the infrared field that causes the modulation uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, we expect uh, the IR field strength to monotonically decrease and that's not what uh, the harmonics show. And second, uh, if the IR field were to change, then we're responsible for the modulation, then all the harmonics would modulate simultaneously, and this is not what we find. Now, to confirm that we have increased the extraction depth, we, uh, we, study, uh, we study the um, harmonic emission from um, uh, at different guiding distances, essentially uh, fabricating different samples and etching them down to different different heights. And as a control experiment, we also um, as a control experiment, we also um, do the same on the on a thin field, which is essentially the areas adjacent to the grading. In the on the gratings, we see a monotonic increase up to about 700 nanometer guiding distance, which is um, 100 times more. It's a hundredfold increase of the extraction depth compared to bulk because we know that the absorption length is about seven nanometers in silicon. 
at this wavelength. Um, as, as a control, on the bulk instead, we only see a, a strong modulation, but is the same for all the harmonics. And it agrees with the variation of the infrared field strength inside the film due to Fabry Pro interference, which also tells right away that the harmonic emission from the bulk is already saturated down to the thinnest measure film thickness, 100 nanometer. And that, and that agrees with the absorption length being only seven or 10 nanometers. Now, since we have increased the extraction that we would expect the, the device to generate a flux, a significant more flux. And that's somewhat what we see in, in, the, in the experiment. We see that the grading structures uh, emits more or comparable flux than the, um, than the bulk with a somewhat diminishing gain with increasing harmonic order, which is something we are trying to address um, or trying to understand now. And it, it's, it's remarkable, first of all, because this occurs despite phase mismatch. I mean, the linear polarization and the generated harmonics are not, do not propagate at the same speed. So the process is not phase matched. And there is three times less nonlinear material, silicon, because the gratings uh, obviously have been etched. The other remarkable fact is that the grating performs so well at all the powers, all the way up to the damage threshold, which is represented by the short drop in both the grating and the bulk uh, curves. Um, and this is new because in the, in the um, devices that I've shown you before, where the, that were designed to enhance the infrared field and boost the nonlinearity, in all these devices, early damage and the small emission volume meant that if you pump bulk hard enough, eventually it would outperform the structure. And this is not the case anymore in, the, in these one-dimensional gradings. Now, looking ahead, we are trying now to um, <clears throat> pattern the grading along the propagation direction to achieve, to control the phase velocities and possibly achieve a phase matching or a quasi-phase match interaction, which would uh, boost the flux even further. I would like to conclude the section um, now mentioning that absorption is actually a shared limitation, clearly very strong in solids and liquids as well, uh, from which we can also generate harmonics now. Um, but it also is a limitation in the XCV spectral region for high pressure gases. And in principle, what I've shown you now with this, the method of these one dimensional gratings or the, the, the gaps could be extended to uh, gases and liquids uh, if they're combined with pattern solids. Also, it does not require strong fields to work. In principle, it can work for perturbative nonlinearities as well. And for example, it could be used to extend the uh, use of nonlinear crystals um, to their absorption bands. Now, I would like to conclude uh, for good now, uh, just uh, summarizing that I've presented you um, how nanostructure solids can uh, benefit um, high harmonic generation and extreme photonics probably in general. Um, with two streams, one uh, what most people have been working on at enhancing uh, the driver and another stream that instead tackle the intrinsic problems uh, or limitation of harmonic generation. <clears throat> um, I, I believe nanostructural solids add this new exciting dimension for extreme photonics, which will eventually lead us into a, a new, new way to develop out of second technology. Thank you. Thank you, Giulio. Thank you very much. Um, we will go to questions and answers. And I think still there are some problems with the questions, but some questions are coming through. And there are some questions turning up on an internal chat, which perhaps I can ask after the, uh, after the first ones are asked. So um, let me pass this on to Sean or Jeremy, and they can ask the questions that come formally as questions. Okay. Uh, thanks, Julio, for the very nice uh, talk. So, um, yeah, I see the one that was that came from uh, one of the panelists here. So maybe I'll start with that one. Um, the question is: In the beginning of your talk, you show high harmonic generation in several high Q resonator structures. If the quality factor is high, the line width that the resonator can accept is also very narrow. So, how does this narrowness affect your nonlinear? process given that you are using a laser with a large bandwidth. Does this fact hint that you would get better harmonic generation from narrower lasers? 
so now it's a good question. Um, I don't think, um, so for harmonic generation, you want high fields and that means short pulses. You can't just use very long pulses and low fields. Uh, and of course you cannot use, you cannot put an infinite amount of energy into a crystal, so you cannot use high fields and long pulses. So short pulses is key, like anything in attosecond science, um, which also means that if you have a very narrow line with resonator, that probably will not do much because it will effectively narrow your bandwidth and therefore lower the field and lengthen the pulse. Um, the plasmonic structures in this sense, they're kind of ideal because they have such a wide bandwidth. The metasurface instead have, has this narrow funnel-like interference. And um, in, in, in truthfully, it is not clear to me and I think to my colleagues as well, how truly that metasurface uh, works for high harmonics. Where, how, how, how are we making use of the, um, of the narrow funnel-like interference? Because clearly there is an enhancement, but whether the funnel type interference plays a role, uh, that is not so clear to me. Okay, thanks. And there's actually a follow-up question uh, on this from the panelist. Uh, what is the Q of the resonators you used and uh, what is the bandwidth of the laser you used? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what the Q is. I can point you to the paper. And also there is the linear, linear version of the theory. Um, I can go back to that. There's also, okay, so, so, so this is the paper and there is also the linear version, linear optics version uh, down here. Um, definitely, so I think the laser bandwidth uh, was comparable to the larger, to the larger resonance, but not to the sharp uh, uh, peak here. I think that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Um, now let's move to some of the audience questions and I'll remind everyone to type them in at the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the first one I see here is, uh, could you apply cascaded nonlinear process to generate higher harmonics in metasurfaces to avoid damaging the sample by inten high intense fundamental beam? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> To some extent, at some point, there is no way you can make the eleventh harmonic by efficiently cascading uh, two photon or three photon processes. Um, so at some point, the strong field response takes over, um, and that's sort of um, stereotypical for um, strong field uh, and out of second uh, physics, where. Um, some of these spectrum exhibit a plateau, so an enhanced efficiency over perturbative nonlinearities, even if cascaded. Um, whether um, cascaded would be better for the lower harmonics? Possibly. I, I don't rule it out. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I'll also, uh, forgive me, I haven't uh, been naming the person asking the questions, but I'll, I'll start doing that now. Uh, so the next one I see here is uh, from Guillermo Erno, and his question is, for the disc and rod plasmonic device, you showed strong field lasting picoseconds in the resonator, at least in the simulation. Do you think that the harmonics are emitted for a relatively longer time than the pulse? Yeah, so that that's sort of ties to what I've, I've, I've hinted before in the previous question. Um, my guess is harmonics are emitted here. Um, rather than in from the dark mode, um, <clears throat> for two reasons: one, the peak, the field is highest, and the second reason is that the harmonic, the width, is not significantly narrower than what you would expect from. Actually, I have the data. Why don't I look at it? So, so okay, so it, it's it's somewhat um, uh, narrower than than the sharp resonance. So you would think that the emission lasts a little bit longer. So, so maybe there is an effect, but we haven't timed the emission to know where it is, where where it happens, or we haven't imaged it to look where from the metasurface is is uh, is emitted. That, I think that answers the question. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, the next one comes from Professor Karimi. 
Uh, he says, uh, very nice talk, Julio. I'm asking a question that I asked a while ago. It is very easy to structure control the orientation of liquid crystal molecules in 3D. Would you think that dynamic control of the refractive index will give you any interesting features? I, I think I think I already talked to Ibrahim about this in the past, and um, I'd be very interested to to know more about how we can use liquid crystals for uh, uh, n strong fields together. Um, I think I think that answers. Okay. Um, and maybe let's uh, ask uh, one more um, from Professor Jacob uh, Critch. Uh, he says, thank you for the very nice talk. You motivated your work as helping to make functional devices. Can you say more about your vision of what functionalities you want to enable with high harmonic generation in these materials? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, there are, um, at the moment, um, essentially, I would, I would think uh, sensors is one prime example of where strong fields could really beat what you can do with um, um, standard um, um, type of sensor, even optical sensors. Uh, for example, in the plasmonic experiment, um, you could sense a change in the refractive index by looking at the, uh, or sensing the phase variation across the resonance as the resonance shifts. Um, and if you were to do this at the 10th harmonic, you would get 10 times the sensitivity to that shift. Uh, so that's a, a simple example of how and why um, high harmonics is a great tool to enhance sensing capabilities. Uh, beyond this, the, um, the fact that we can make on-chip XUV or VUV sources uh, would be great, in my opinion, to, to have for uh, on-chip UV spectroscopy that does not require vacuum and does not um, um, and, and so it would be sort of a portable way to have a UV, UV spectrometer on, on your fingertips. Um, this would be a, another example. Um, I think that for the moment is what, uh, what is in my mind. Um, basically sensors, I think so. And then maybe something else will come up, but it will be too late to say. Um, perhaps that's the last question. Is that the last question, John? Um, there are a couple more here, I guess, if we have. Um, um, well, let's take one more. It's still another minute or two till 2.30. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, the next one here is from Serge de Granier, de Granier excuse me. Um, one of the slides indicated that dielectrics are the best solids to generate high harmonics. Uh, why is this the case? Uh, let me correct. It is not the best to generate high harmonics. It's the one that makes the highest photon energy. And uh, if you're asking what, uh, so to me, the best harmonics, I think it depends on what you want to do with it. For example, for me, the best harmonics is silicon because I can make devices with it. Um, if you are um, uh, talking about dielectrics, um, they're great. They're, they're what we need to reach into the, into the VUV or the XUV uh, spectral region. Um, what, what was the question about? I think I missed, uh, can you say it again? Uh, sorry, let me try to pull it up here again. I have it, uh, Sean. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one of your slides indicated that dielectrics are the best solids to generate high harmonics. Why is this the case? Oh, okay, why? So, okay, as I said, not necessarily the best. Why is it the case that they emit in the, in the XCV? Uh, the reason is that due to their larger band gap, we can pump them harder before breakdown occurs. And if you pump them harder, it means you can gain the electron that is involved in the harmonic generation can gain more energy. And of course it helps that you start already from a 9 EV band gap as opposed to a, just a few EV band gap. So that's um, a rule of thumb uh, reason why that is the case. But then different solids have different efficiencies of course and that becomes more complicated to understand why. Okay, so let me take the opportunity again to thank Julio for a very good talk. 
very clear and everything like that. To put the context, put this whole session in context, um, from Girard, you heard high intensity physics pushed to the very extreme and the possibility that we can even use it to um, influence particle physics and experiments in particle physics, very extreme physics. Um, so that's one side of extreme photonics or very high intensity physics. But the other side is to bring it into ordinary materials, into solids, and to probe them in completely different ways. And that's what we heard from Julio. I'd like to draw your attention as well to the talk coming up on Friday on metamaterials. And so you might wish to think about metamaterials and think about this in this talk in the context of the metamaterial talk that you'll hear on Friday. Now, the Shallow Towns Symposia have always had three parts. They've always had a high profile speaker, Gerard Maru, a young speaker, Julio Vampa, and posters by some of the best PhD and postdoc students anywhere in the world. And so I suggest that you now take the opportunity to go explore Zoom for a poster session. And uh, so that's what we've set up. I believe you have to leave and get the uh, link to the poster session. Um, but you could wait just a minute and see if uh, Natalie will uh, put you in. But I think we were all sent a link to the poster session yesterday, and you should have it if they know about you. But perhaps Natalie can let you in anyway. Um, so if you don't have a link, stay on. Okay, thank you. And I'll see you at the posters. <laughs>